So it is my pleasure to welcome Chris to our rather intimate group today. Um, uh, Chris did his PhD at McMaster University in Canada, and yeah. uh, then he joined Trent as a member of the School of Environment. Uh, and I can't remember whether you were our second or third. I was the first, and I think you might have been second or third. I was third. No, third I was third. Person yeah, retired was, in the department. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he ultimately retired and became a professor emeritus in 2021. He's held many different positions at Trent, including director of the Institute for Watershed Sciences, Dean of Research and Graduate Studies. He's also a senior research fellow with the UN University Institute for Water, Environment and Health, and is editor in chief for the journal Archives of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. He has a broad range of interests, including research on environmental fate and effects of chemical contaminants, including nanoparticles. And his previous international experience includes leading watershed management projects in Mexico, Ecuador, and working to increase research and ecosystem capacity, uh, sorry, ecosystem management capacity within institutions in Indonesia and the Caribbean. So with that, Chris, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I'm gonna focus a little bit on nanosilver since uh, this is an area which I've been involved in and in, in terms of research for quite a while now, but also I'll start off with some sort of general um, topics. Uh, it might be a bit of a, a repeat for uh, I'm sure all of you because uh, some of the other speakers that have um, participated in the seminar series have have touched on it, but it you know repeating is not such a bad thing. So just a little bit on nanomaterials in particular. Basically, there's four different types: inorganic based nanomaterials, carbon based nanomaterials some organic based nanomaterials and finally composite nanomaterials are becoming um, widely used in a variety of uh, industrial settings. Inorganic and carbon based nanomaterials are far and away the most uh, widely used of uh, nanomaterials and they are used in uh, consumer products. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, nanosilver and its use in odor and stain resistant clothing, sports equipment, etc., and antibacterial agents. Uh, but also they're used in a range of cosmetics and personal care products, sunscreen, shampoos, et cetera. But then uh, also there's applications in industry, in the electronics uh, field, as well as in the biomedical field. So as you can see, there's, it's projected that uh, the global nanotechnology market will increase over the next uh, decade or so. Um, those projections seem to vary depending upon whether you have a skeptical estimate or an optimistic estimate, but there is no doubt that um, the global market for nanomaterials will continue to increase over the next little while. So the question is then, okay, with more and more of these products and the volumes increasing, what are going to be the potential impacts upon the environment? So just a few definitions, which again, my previous, um, the previous participants in this uh, seminar series might have already covered. But as we know, nanoparticles are basically structures with um, at least one dimension that's below 100 nanometers um, in size. Nanomaterials are basically uh, different uh, forms of nanoparticles that serve particular functions, sometimes called engineered nanomaterials. And then finally, nanoproducts are the commercial products that are formed from, from those uh, nanomaterials. And uh, nanomaterials can be in a variety of uh, matrices. Uh, they could be bound to specific surfaces. They could be suspended in, in liquids, uh, suspended in solids, or finally uh, airborne, although um, I, I don't personally know of any products which are uh, airborne uh, because of the potential health impacts. But those are the kinds of matrices that um, nanomaterials can be, um, can be found in. So why basically are nanomaterials uh, useful in, um, for industry as well as in the biomedical field and other areas? Basically, it's because of two properties. One is uh, surface area. And to illustrate that, you can see that a basketball has a surface area of about uh, of 0 0.18 um, meters squared. And you can see the, that uh, the surface area of uh, Baseballs and golf balls is similarly quite small, but if you take a mound of nanoparticles, which is about uh, consists of uh, particles that are about 10 nanometers in size, uh, 
that mound of being approximately the size of a golf ball, you can see that there's a huge um, surface area. And so this is useful uh, for some applications to have that large surface area. The other thing is that basically you can tune the properties of, um, of uh, nanomaterials based upon the size. So if you look at gold, we know that gold, of course, is in bulk materials, very inert. That's why we use it in jewelry, et cetera, where it won't tarnish over time. But if you take uh, nano gold uh, with dimensions between two and four nanometers, it is actually it has high catalytic activity and it has a color which is red. But if you go even smaller down to one nanometer, it uh, has low reactivity and it has a different color. So we can tune, in many cases, the uh, properties, for instance, the catalytic properties of uh, nanomaterials by just um, selecting the different sizes. So those are the kinds of features of nanomaterials which are utilized in, for various applications. So what about the um, distribution of these materials in the environment and potential for impacts? So should we be concerned about the release of these nanomaterials in the environment? There's various um, mechanisms by which uh, these things can be uh, discharged into the environment during their production. For instance, there could be release of uh, nanomaterials into the air or into the water or into soils. Uh, and then when they're in use, uh, also potential for release into various environmental matrices. And then at the end of life, what do we do with them? We could potentially recycle them back into products, but most of them wind up going into landfills. And so there's potential for release of these materials into um, groundwater, uh, also uh, potential for release into other environmental matrices. So the big question is, will these nanomaterials harm organisms in the environment, the aquatic environment, the terrestrial environment, uh, and even potentially in air? How do we conduct environmental risk assessments for new products as they appear on the market? And when I originally got into um, research, this was a big concern for Environment Canada is, uh, OK, can we use the usual environmental risk assessment methods that we use for other types of products, um, chemicals, for instance, pesticides, and can we apply those to nanomaterials? For instance, if we're looking at uh, nano-sized titanium dioxide at 10 nanometers, is that the same risk assessment that we would apply to nano-sized titanium dioxide at at 50 nanometers in, in size. Are there differences? Should we, do we need to apply different risk assessment um, uh, procedures in order to look at these uh, different products? So that was a big concern. So finally switching to, okay, how do these uh, nanoparticles potentially cause toxicity to organisms. There are various mechanisms that I've kind of illustrated in this uh, figure. One is that potentially these nanoparticles could interact with the cell membrane, uh, disrupt the cell membrane and in, that, uh, in that way. This could uh, have impacts. For instance, they could uh, bind to various receptor sites which are uh, available on the cell membrane and disrupt those and that could have some influence. Also, you can have release of the constituents through dissolution. So release of um, cadmium, for instance, from, uh, from uh, cadmium-based uh, nanoparticles. Zinc oxide, you could have release of uh, zinc ion. And as we'll talk about later, you could have release of uh, silver ion from um, silver nanoparticles. So that's potentially uh, a mechanism by which those nanoparticles could cause toxicity. You could have the nanoparticles basically being vectors for other contaminants that are associated with them, organic contaminants, you know, things like uh, PAHs, et cetera, could be associated with nanoparticles or other toxic metals, and those could be transported into cells along with uh, nanoparticles. And then finally, you could have um, UV light, which uh, reacts with, the, with those nanoparticles to um, result in the release of reactive oxygen species, which then um, would then have effects upon either cell membranes or potentially 
be incorporated into the cells and, and cause responses there. So just an example here, there's an in vitro uh, test that was done on titanium dioxide, which showed that basically titanium dioxide itself was not particularly uh, toxic to goldfish skin cells in vitro, but when exposed to UV light, particularly in 2000 nanometer wavelength, um, caused considerable uh, damage to, to those uh, goldfish uh, skin cells, epithelial cells. So that was an example of uh, how um, the production of uh, reactive oxygen species by exposure to UV light can enhance toxicity. And then if these things can actually pass through the cell membrane, then potentially there's uh, effects upon uh, intercellular um, constituents. Uh, you could have effects upon membranes such as the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, these uh, nanoparticles are small enough that they can react um, directly with DNA, for instance, causing effects upon gene expression, effects upon macromolecules such as lipids and uh, proteins, and then obviously through um, uh, effects upon uh, proteins uh, affect um, enzyme activity. So if these things can get through the cell membrane, then potentially you could have intracellular responses. So those are some of the mechanisms by which nanoparticles can cause toxicity. So switching to then the subject uh, I wanna talk about, that's uh, nanosilver. Nanosilver by far has the greatest global market share, uh, mainly because it's used in a variety of products because of its bactericidal activity. So for instance, you might be aware that uh, Nanosilver is incorporated into various textiles that are used in sports clothing, socks and underwear uh, as an odor fighting, I suppose, um, constituents. So because of the bactericidal activity, it kills uh, bacteria, which can um, make your socks and underwear and sports clothing uh, smell um, not so nice. Uh, also used in bactericidal creams and ointments. So uh, used in, in a variety of products, which I've kind of illustrated over on the right. And of course, then if you wash those products or wash your skin that might have bactericidal creams and ointments on it, there's potential for the release of uh, nanosilver into municipal wastewater treatment plants. And then through wastewater treatment plants, they might potentially enter into the aquatic environment through the discharges of uh, treated wastewater. So once in the aquatic environment, uh, what is the potential? Uh, what is the potential fate and and possible effects of nanosilver? Well, once again, I put together an illustration here of what could happen. Um, potential, I suppose, for air water exchange. Uh, it's probably not too common that these nanoparticles would be um, would be transported into the atmosphere, although pot potentially through aerosols, that might be possible. Um, agglomeration is, uh, or sometimes called aggregation, um, is a potential response. So basically this is where the nanoparticles either um, associate with each other or with other particulate material that's in the water column um, and that can increase the actual over, uh, overall size. Uh, in many cases, um, the size would increase above the threshold of 100 nanometers for nano-sized uh, particles. Uh, those particles can then um, settle out of suspension and then be deposited into sediments. There's also potential for these particles to pass through uh, various trophic levels uh, from, of course, plankton, phytoplankton to zooplankton to small fish to larger fish, and then potentially, I suppose, to fish-eating uh, mammals and birds. So that uh, would be bioaccumulation. Whether biomagnification is a possibility is um, open to question. Um, most of the literature suggests that that doesn't happen. It's mainly just bioaccumulation in various uh, organisms in aquatic environments. And then finally, you can get uh, free uh, or dissolution of the particles to their constituent uh, free ions. And in the case of uh, silver nanoparticles, that would be the silver ion. Um, also, you can get associations over on the right. I've shown that you can get associations between nanoparticles and natural organic matter. 
So basically the natural organic matter coats the nanoparticles and actually that uh, reduces the degree of aggregation or agglomeration uh, that can occur, but you can get homo uh, aggregation as it's called, as I mentioned, that's association of nanoparticles with each other or hetero aggregation or agglomeration where the particles associate, uh, sorry, the nanoparticles associate with other particulate material in the water. So what are the research questions that, uh, that uh, have to be tackled in terms of um, the potential for effects uh, and the fate of uh, nanosilver in the aquatic environment? So what are the concentrations, first of all, of uh, silver nanoparticles and other uh, silver species in the environment? What organisms are in the aquatic environment are most sensitive? Uh, what uh, transformation products or the original nanoparticles are causing toxicity. So uh, most of the focus has been on whether silver nanoparticles directly can cause uh, toxicity or whether silver ion can cause toxicity. But as we'll talk about a little bit later, there are other silver species which are formed, including um, silver sulfide under reducing conditions. And uh, there's been very little research to take a look at, at whether uh, those um, transformation products are potentially toxic. And then finally, what are the mechanisms of toxicity? Are they membrane effects which occur on the outside of the cell or intracellular effects or potentially inflammatory responses which are caused as a result of the association of uh, nanoparticles with uh, the cell surface? And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, a preoccupation for regulatory agencies was how do we assess ecological risks uh, for nanoparticles? Are they different from other types of chemicals that we are evaluating or can we use the same methods that we've always used for uh, chemical contaminants? So releases of nanosilver, just a few examples of the kinds of um, potential releases. So there's some data which indicate that, uh, for instance, the amount of uh, silver that you might get in uh, socks is uh, over 1000 micrograms per gram, which is added to sock material. This is in uh, micrograms per gram of silver. Uh, it's difficult for us to measure uh, actually silver nanopart uh, the, the amounts of uh, silver nanoparticles, but we can easily measure the amounts of total silver. And then um, in wash water, the, in our washing machines, if we we're washing socks or sports clothing, et cetera, you can get up to 1300 micrograms per liter. However, most of it is agglomerated or aggregated in um, amounts or, or sorry, in sizes, which are greater than 450 nanometers. So that would actually take them outside of the um, nanoform uh, size range. Um, good deal of release of the silver ion. Uh, but also if we use bleaches, then there's potential for formation of silver chloride as, as a result of the use of the, of the bleach. Then if this stuff is transported into wastewater treatment plants, what happens under reducing conditions, which is quite common in uh, uh, anaerobic digesters, for instance, um, and even in aerobic digesters um, that have hypoxia, you can get formation of silver sulfide um, a lot of it partitions into biosolids, as you might expect, but there is some release of uh, both silver nanoparticles and silver ion into the discharge from wastewater treatment plants. And then finally, what are the concentrations that we normally find in, um, in uh, surface waters? Typically, those concentrations are in the few data that have been generated uh, indicate that uh, concentrations are typically less than one microgram per liter of, uh, of total silver from the silver nanoparticles. Um, and then in sediments, typically less than five micrograms per gram near the discharges from wastewater treatment plants. But a fair amount of it just uh, partitions into biosolids. Um, so you can have concentrations in biosolids uh, up to 50 micrograms per gram dry weight. And so this opens up a whole area of research, and there's quite a bit of uh, literature on the potential for effects on biosolids that are applied onto agricultural land, 
Uh, I'm not going to touch on that in this particular presentation, but it's certainly a, a topic uh, for discussion of potential effects upon terrestrial organisms as well as um, uh, soil uh, bacteria uh, as a result of exposure to uh, silver nanoparticles and silver ion and other species in biosolids applied as soil amendments. So at Trent, we, we did a whole bunch of studies on, um, on the toxicity of, uh, of silver nanoparticles. And for those studies, we, did, uh, we used a model uh, material that we actually bought from a, a company uh, located in Toronto called Vive Nano. And we bought this stuff at great expense <laughs> from Vive Nano. It's, um, uh, material that is between four and, or at least the manufacturer suggests is between four and 10 nanometers in size. Uh, it's ca uh, capped with uh, carboxyfunctionalized polyacrylate. And so for that reason, um, uh, it can be placed in suspension fairly easily in water. Um, the amount of dissolved uh, silver is actually quite low. So dissolution is not uh, a particular problem. So we did some transmission electron microscopy to evaluate. And sh you can see some of the images from the TEM there, which indicate that it did in fact uh, not aggregate to a great extent. And we had um, uh, silver nanoparticles uh, uh, placed in suspension. And you can see using an analytical method called asymmetric field flow fractionation, AF4, that we were able to determine that in fact the um, the size range was between six and eight nanometers when we uh, suspended the stuff in water. So we were reasonably assured that uh, this material was uh, present in, in water for our tests in, um, in the appropriate size range for uh, looking at toxicity. So we did a bunch of work on uh, acute toxicity to tadpoles, bullfrog tadpoles, uh, and also uh, some acute toxicity work with our favorite uh, little aquarium fish, the Japanese Madaka. And we determined that in fact, the acute toxicity, the LC50s for these early life stages were uh, quite high between 1300 and approximately 3000 micrograms per liter for bullfrog tadpoles, depending upon the type of water that uh, we use for the tests. So you can see that uh, depending upon, you know, the type of pond water or that we were using, you get quite a variation in terms of the LC50, depending upon dissolved uh, organic carbon concentration, et cetera. In the particular uh, water that we used for our Japanese Medaka, which was uh, basically uh, Tanabe River water, you can see again that the uh, LC50 was quite high at 2,300 micrograms per liter. So. Uh, tadpoles and early life stages of fish don't seem to be particularly uh, sensitive to, to this nanosilver. Uh, we did some tests with neonates of Daphnia magna, and you can see that uh, Daphnia magna were uh, a little more sensitive. Uh, we got an LC50 of 2.75 micrograms per liter, and you can see the 48 hour LC50 curve basically um, showing the. Um, the uh, derivation of that uh, LC50. We then also did some acute toxicity tests with, uh, with some algal species. We uh, went with uh, a monoculture of Euglena gracilis and found an LC50 of 25 micrograms per liter in terms of reductions in chlorophyll as well as cell counts. And then um, actually, uh, Maggie Xenopoulos and Paul Frost and uh, their graduate students did some work on uh, exposures of natural algae from two lakes to uh, silver nanoparticles um, and uh, tried to see whether uh, additions of uh, phosphorus actually had any effect in um, ameliorating those toxic effects. It appeared that additions of phosphorus did do some um, good in terms of reducing the toxicity, but it wasn't huge. Um, and the LC EC50s for reduction in growth rates of those natural phytoplankton populations were between 10 and 15 micrograms per liter. 
So uh, also in terms of uh, bacterial um, effects upon uh, bacteria, again, Maggie and Paul's grad students did some work in which they looked at um, effects upon bacterial production uh, as measured by leucine uptake. Um, and uh, they did these uh, tests on natural bacterial communities collected from lake streams and ponds. What they found was that uh, one hour after treatment with uh, different concentrations of uh, nanosilver, um, in all of the treatments, the uh, bacterial production was knocked down to near zero. Uh, but after 48 hours, there was some recovery uh, in terms of the uh, production of those bacteria, at least at the lower concentrations below 0.5. Uh, milligrams per liter. So the EC50s for effects upon bacteria were between 15 and 276 micrograms of silver per liter in the treatments with different types of surface water, the uh, ponds, streams, and, and lakes. Um, and then finally, they did another um, study on bacterial uh, communities in which they also looked at um, at uh, bacterial production using flow cytometry, but also looked at uh, changes in bacterial community structure uh, using, um, using PCR, uh, two different PCR uh, mechanisms, which I uh, don't particularly understand. So I won't uh, dwell on that. But what they found was, again, that um, one hour after treatment uh, of bacterial populations, natural bacterial populations from a stream and from an urban pond there was knocked down in terms of bacterial production, but there was some um, uh, recovery of bacterial production, at least at the lower concentrations of silver after five days of treatment. And then there was uh, effects upon community structure as a result of the, those exposures. So if we take all of those data that we generated at Trent University in terms of acute toxicity, as well as some data that are gathered from the literature, basically here's the story, is that the um, effects upon lower trophic levels in terms of bacteria as well as algae, um, these uh, responses are, uh, sorry, these organisms are more sensitive to the effects of uh, nano silver in terms of e uh, EC50s and LC50s over short term exposures than invertebrates, fish, and amphibians. So uh, basically, then uh, we should be concerned about lower trophic levels in terms of exposure to uh, nano silver. And this makes sense because, I mean, these um, nano silver has bactericidal uh, effects. And so we might expect that this is uh, what we would see. So you might be familiar with these toxicity probability curves, but if you're not, basically what you, you do is you take all of these different uh, EC50 and LC50 data and you plot them in terms of the toxic threshold where you would see the EC50s occurring. And when, then what we did was we estimated what the no observed effect concentrations would be uh, based upon a simple calculation, which was to take the EC50 or LC50 value and divide it by 10. And that's what you see there on the squares. And then what you superimpose on top of that is the, the um, estimates of uh, the concentrations of uh, silver that we would see in uh, nanograms of silver per liter in surface waters as a result of the discharge of uh, nanosilver. And as you can see on the lower part of the curve for the no observed effect concentrations, we get some overlap with the estimated concentrations that we might expect um, in surface waters as a result of the discharges primarily from wastewater treatment plants. So, um, and this is for uh, acute uh, exposures. So basically over short term, 48 to 96 hours. So then the question might be, well, what would be the potential for adverse effects, particularly in lower trophic levels, algae and bacteria, as a result of long-term exposure to silver nanoparticles at the low microgram per liter uh, range, or even the high nanogram per liter range? 
However, there's a lot of uncertainties associated with um, trying to make those extrapolations. One thing is the exposure assessments. There actually are very few measured environmental concentrations for nanosilver, and that's because of the analytical sensitivity issues um, associated with the various methods that we have for analyzing nanosilver in, um, in the aquatic environment. Uh, we can measure silver, um, and, and the sensitivity for measuring silver is, is actually quite good. Uh, high nanogram per liter range or low microgram per liter range. But actually measuring for um, nanosilver particles is difficult. Uh, and also we lack data on silver speciation, um, how much um, silver ion is present and, and particularly how much silver sulfide and other species are present. And then in terms of the effects assessment, primarily in the literature, we have acute toxicity data over the you know, as I said, 48 to 96 hours, we have very little data on uh, long-term exposures. And we're not, it's not clear if toxicity in many cases is due to the actual nanoparticles or other solar species. And then finally, a big thing is that we're, we're, we're doing all of this toxicity testing with pristine nanosilver. As I mentioned, we bought that stuff from Vive Nano uh, but what happens with this material after it's aged for a while, after it goes through dissolution or agglomeration or, um, you know, coating with, uh, with dissolved organic uh, material? Uh, what happens in terms of the toxicity with this aged material? We have very little data on that. Okay, which brings us to the follow-up studies. Um, I believe Holger Hintelman talked about the studies that we did at uh, the... Uh, experimental lakes area, IISD experimental lakes area, but uh, I'm going to also talk about it in terms of some of the acute toxicity um, work that we did, sorry, chronic toxicity work that we did there. So as I mentioned, in acute toxicity tests, it looks like the lower trophic levels, bacteria and algae are the most sensitive. So the proposal that we prepared for NSERC uh, back in the when the strategic grants program was still in effect was okay um, in terms of chronic toxicity and at the ecosystem level there's potential for effects upon uh, algal and bacterial productivity maybe effects upon decomposition rates in terms of uh, potential impacts on bacteria and also nutrient cycling so we need to study these kinds of effects at the ecosystem level and so we were successful in getting uh, funding from NSERC to do this uh, whole lake addition study um, at the IISD Experimental Lakes area in Northern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario. And then previous to that, we uh, did some lake mesocosm work to hone our skills, if you will, before we did the whole lake addition. And we called this the Lake Ecosystem Nanosilver or Lens Project. So just a bit of a introduction to uh, what we did. The IISD ELA field station is located on the red star. What we did was we chose uh, a couple of lakes, Lake 222, which was our lake for dosing and Lake 221, which is a reference lake. We also looked at some other reference lakes. In order to get there, primarily our graduate students and other HQP had to do three different portages in order to get to the lakes. Um, uh, and they typically did that every second day throughout the exposure period. Um, and that was to bring nanosilver suspensions to the lake, uh, which were added through a peristaltic pump on a, uh, at a site located at the side of the lake. And what we were trying to do was to replicate what might happen, for instance, if there was discharges from a wastewater treatment plant into surface waters. So in other whole lake addition studies, for instance, with um, estradiol that Karen Kidd, they puttered around the lake in a boat and, uh, and discharged the estradiol. But in this case, we decided to go with a point source located on the, uh, at the edge of the lake on the western shore. The lake is about, uh, about uh, 6.5 meters in depth. Uh, it actually varied a little bit in depth because some beavers decided that they would build a dam at the far eastern end. And so that increased the water level 
in the second year of uh, nanosilver additions. Uh, quite high uh, dissolved organic carbon, is, so this is a high, um, has high levels of, um, of DOC. It's quite a tea-colored lake, the reference lake as well. So during the early addition phases, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this too much because I believe Holger Hintelman covered this. Basically, what happened was that, uh, in fact, the nanosilver was distributed quite evenly throughout the uh, lake, which we were very happy about. My nightmare was that we would spend uh, in total about uh, $60,000 on nanosilver and it would all be deposited within about 10 meters of the discharge site. But in fact, it uh, was distributed quite evenly around the lake. And in fact, the thermocline was not a barrier to its distribution even into the hyperlimnion. The total uh, silver concentrations that we measured vary between one and 10 micrograms per liter. The dissolved silver concentrations were actually quite low. And in fact, the mean particle size was around 22 nanometers. So it was nano sized and the number of particles per liter were greater than one times 10 to the 10th um, particles per liter. So that was the uh, good news was that the experiment in fact worked in terms of the distribution of nanosilver throughout the lake. So uh, the big surprise was that we didn't see much in terms of a response in uh, particularly the uh, phytoplankton community. This is some uh, uh, data from one of um, Maggie and Paul's um, graduate students uh, and what they determined was that basically in terms of biomass as well as the distribution of pigments um, within the um, experimental lake, lake 222, and also the reference lake 221 uh, was there was no real change in terms of the biomass and, and pigment distribution um, before and uh, during the addition of nanosilver and in fact, the uh, in the reference lake as well. So not much happened in terms of the uh, phytoplankton. Um, Andrea Conine also had some data in her thesis that hasn't been published, basically showing that in terms of the uh, decomposition rates within the lake, uh, there was no real, uh, this was decomposition of leaf litter bags, which were placed uh, in Lake 222 and also in the reference lake, there was no real change in uh, decomposition rates as well. So much to our surprise, not really much happened in terms of the lower trophic levels, but to our surprise, we did see some responses in, in the fish. So this shows the uh, concentrations of silver, total silver, in the liver of both uh, yellow perch and in northern pike. And what you can see is that there was actually quite a um, marked increase in the concentrations of silver, uh, particularly in northern pike, up to, uh, I believe the highest concentration we saw was about 3,700 nanograms per gram wet weight. And if you can compare that to the concentrations that we saw in water, which were one to 10 nanograms per mil, you can see that that's a fair amount of uh, bioaccumulation that we were seeing in, um, in Northern Pike, uh, particularly in the liver, lower concentrations in gill, um, spleen and other tissues, gonadal tissues. But also in the yellow perch, we saw some uh, bioaccumulation of, uh, of silver as well. But it disappeared fairly rapidly after the additions of nanosilver in um, 2014 and 2015. You can see that by uh, June of 2017, the concentrations in liver of pike were just above uh, detection limits and below detection limits in the, in the yellow perch. But what surprised us was that the density of yellow perch actually declined quite markedly. So in our reference lake, which was actually Lake 239, it wasn't 221, because the uh, fish community structure in 221 was uh, quite different than in 222. Uh, but 239 had a similar um, community structure of yellow perch and northern pike. Um, you can see that the yellow perch density remained essentially unchanged in the reference lake. 
but there was a marked decline in the number of fish per hectare from about 1300 fish per uh, yellow perch per hectare um, before the additions to about uh, 8500 or yeah, it was about 8500 uh, yellow perch per hectare in the first year after the additions of nano silver. So a good number of the perch disappeared uh, from Lake 222 um, over that period of time. At the same time, we also saw a reduction in the uh, weights of the northern pike. You can see on our reference lake, which was a lake, again Lake 239, you can see that aside from a kind of a mysterious dip in the uh, uh, fish weights in 2016, and we're looking at five-year-old northern pike, I'd, I haven't shown all of the data. We evaluated the um, fish weights for northern pike in three, four, no, two, three, four, and five-year-old northern pike. But you can see that they remain fairly constant in our reference lake, but there was a decline in the uh, weights of the northern pike, uh, five-year-old northern pike, uh, during the additions in 2014 and then also post additions in 2016 and 2017. So what's going on? Well, so the yellow perch populations declined in Lake 222. And we can see that the Northern Pike growth rates declined. So is this because there was less perch to eat? Possibly. Uh, it appears that the pike switched to eating another fish species, which is present in Lake 222, not their favorite food. Yellow perch are definitely their favorite uh, forage fish, but it appears from the data on the um, density of uh, black nose shiner that we uh, were able to estimate from the number of black nose shiner that we ca caught per seine, that the populations of that particular fish species declined. These are small fish, which are uh, much more uh, active, I suppose, than uh, yellow perch, and they're primarily found in the pelagic zone. So were the pike going after these because they didn't have as much yellow perch to eat, and was there more effort required in order to uh, fulfill their dietary needs? So that's a bit of a question mark. So the question is, why did the yellow perch population decline? We can't rule out that it was direct toxicity. We did some uh, work uh, looking at various biomarkers of oxidative stress, and there was some indication that the yellow perch uh, were showing some oxidative stress. So we have some molecular data as well as some biochemical data indicating that uh, there was oxidative stress. So we can't rule out uh, direct toxicity of exposure to nanosilver as the reason why the uh, yellow perch were declining. But we're thinking that might be more as a result of some indirect effects. So um, Mike Rennie, well, I should mention that all of that work uh, on yellow perch as well as the um, uh, Northern Pike was done th through uh, Mike Rennie, who's at the uh, Lakehead University and his graduate students. Um, and they also did some recent work on looking at carbon isotopic signatures in yellow perch and northern pike, and those data are shown here. So the carbon isotope ratios for literal benthos are more positive relative to the ratios that you would have in, in uh, zooplankton, for instance. So um, what, we've, what they found was that the ratio, carbon isotope ratios became more negative during the um, silver nanoparticle additions uh, and also during the post addition phase. And they did some estimates on the um, consumption of littoral prey as a result of the changes in those carbon isotope signatures. And what they found, as you can see from the top uh, figure, is that the consumption of littoral prey uh, declined from about 20% to near zero in yellow perch um, in the first year after uh, additions. And a northern pike declined from about 70% of littoral uh, prey to about 20% over that period of time. So it appears that there was some shift from benthic resources to pelagic resources. Unfortunately, 
this was not something that we were expecting to see. So we didn't actually gather any data on the effects on, um, on the benthic uh, population uh, in the whole Lake Edition study, uh, which was obviously a mistake on our part. We should have um, we should have considered that, okay, something might be happening in terms of the benthic population because most of this stuff wound up going into the sediments. So here's some data from 2017, two years after the um, additions of silver uh, were terminated. And you can see that at the center buoy station at the deepest point in the lake, you're actually getting quite high concentrations in the first zero to two centimeter core, part of the core. Um, probably as a result of benthic focusing within within the lake, uh, but at another site uh, near the point of additions and also in the littoral zone, you're getting um, concentrations of uh, of uh, silver in in the sediments which are elevated, particularly in the surface layer. So as we might have expected, most of this stuff is um, being deposited in the sediments and and it disappeared from the, from the water column. So what we're thinking that happened then is, okay, during the um, late addition phases and post addition, um, the silver nanoparticles, of course, settled to the bottom of the lake. And what we're hypothesizing is that this had effects on the littoral benthic community. As a result, the yellow perch had uh, less of the benthic invertebrates to eat. And in fact, uh, about half or, well, almost half of the yellow perch disappeared. And as a result of the fact that there was less forage fish for the uh, northern pike to eat, um, there was uh, declines in, in the growth of, those, uh, of that species as well. So that's what we're hypothesizing uh, took place. It is unfortunate that we didn't have any direct, um, direct um, measurements of what was happening in the benthic community, particularly in the littoral zone, uh, but that's our hypothesis. So take home message is uh, ecosystem levels are, level effects are complex, don't always reflect the responses that we observe in short-term toxicity studies with single organisms. Uh, we saw effects on the fish in Lake 222, were those indirect effects? Well, um, we're suggesting that that was the case. We didn't see effects on the plankton communities in Lake 222, which is what we had expected going into the study. Actually, there's very few data in the literature on the effects of uh, silver nanoparticles on benthic organisms, so we need more data. Um, there's some data in the literature on effects in, uh, for instance, polychaete worms in, um, in marine environments, but very little on freshwater environments. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, we need to study the effects of uh, aged nanoparticles uh, in order to have um, a better handle on just what happens when these nanoparticles are present in the environment for a long period of time. So with that, let's go to stop share and I'm open to questions or comments. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, that was excellent. <clears throat> So yes, uh, <coughs> pardon me here. <clears throat> Go ahead and uh, ask questions if uh, any of our audience would like to ask questions. I, uh, I'll go ahead, Ian. Oh, hi, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, great talk. I was just wondering if it is that uh, flow-on effect or indirect effect on the invertebrates, and um, that sort of looks like it was the case. Do you have a, a best guess as to what might be the, the ones that are the key ones to investigate, um, where should we focus uh, super nanotoxicity studies on? Is, is that particular group of, of invertebrates that these fish eat that might be the, the bench, the linchpin? Yeah, so um, uh, clodosterins and other microcrustaceans would certainly be an area, I think. Uh, so, I mean, there there is quite a bit of data there on daphnids, right? Because, uh, you know, Syria, Daphnia and Daphnia are... Uh, are certainly uh, you know common uh, talk so we do have a fair amount of data there on acute toxicity but what we're lacking is uh, okay what are the responses over long term long term exposure so certainly microcrustaceans but also benthic infauna so you know uh, i don't know tube effects worms whatever whatever you want to uh, look at in terms of benthic infauna would certainly i think be uh, 
be a priority area as well. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I come back to something that you said early on in the talk about um, uh, regulatory agencies wanting to know whether they can apply, you know, traditional, uh, yeah. you know, assessment tools to to these things. Given what you've seen uh, with these sort of complex changes, what's your conclusion to that? Well, so there's actually quite a large um, group of work that was funded by OECD on this because of course they're interested in making sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of regulatory approaches but also Environment Canada and basically <laughs> they kind of went with the status quo we'll we'll continue to use the same kind of acute toxicity um, kind of procedures that we've always used with the same organisms we've always used. So again, Daphnids, um, early life stage toxicity tests with, uh, you know, fathead minnows and, and, and zebrafish, uh, as well as algal toxicity and, and that kind of thing. So they've basically gone with the status quo, but as we've seen, I'm not sure that's the right approach. Um, and also, I think they kind of threw up their hands in terms of, okay, is the toxicity of nanosilver at 50 nanometers the same as the toxicity at 10 nanometers? I would suggest no, um, that there's much more potential for, for instance, tra transmembrane uh, transport, uh, the smaller that the, the nanoparticle is. But uh, again, um, they seem to have figured that, okay, um, any old size will do. <laughs> Should we be surprised? <laughs> Uh, I have another question. Um, you, in the early toxicity uh, data you showed us, you were using capped uh, nanosilver yeah. particles. Were they the same ones that you added to the lake? No, um, that was, it would have been too expensive. <laughs> uh, so we went with uh, uh, another polyacrylate capped um, nanosilver material that we were able to buy in bulk from a, a company down in Texas. Um, but um, it was much more, sh shall we say, crude in terms of the, um, the size distribution. So while the Vive Nano stuff was had a very narrow range of size, as I mentioned, between six and eight nanometers, the stuff that we bought from Texas, I think varied from about, I think it was 20 up to about 80 nanometers or whatever. So, um, yeah, so it was a much more crude product, but as a result, it was cheaper. But we still spent $60,000 on it. But anyway, 16 kilograms we added. So, <laughs> probably hey, worth it. We're probably worth more now for, I don't know whether the price of silver has gone up, but anyway. <laughs> You're probably right. Other questions yeah. for Chris? Uh, yes, I see this one. Uh, on the chat from Mary. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. Very interesting talk. Uh, wonder if you could elaborate at all about age and the temporality of effects. For example, how long should we affect, expect the nanoparticles to remain in the sediments? Okay. Um, <laughs> a big question mark, basically. Um, so, we actually have so um ah what's his name from the university of montreal um kevin what's his last name <laughs> anyway wilkinson wilkinson there we go we actually have some dark field uh, microscopy work that uh that they did for us not published um I'll talk about that in a second, but anyway, uh, which basically showed that these nanoparticles could still be uh, visualized um, a good two years in the sediments, a good two years after, uh, af after the additions. So they were present in nanoform, uh, but I suspect over time you would get a good deal of dissolution um, so that uh, you get formation of, um, of silver ion. But also, I'm assuming that under um, under the reducing conditions that you would get in lake sediments, for instance, that a good deal of it would be converted to silver sulfide. But 
um, we don't really have sensitive methods in order to um, be able to determine the exact transformation products. Um, so I'm not sure I've answered the question, but if, as I said, we were able to visualize the actual particles in the sediments uh, up to two years after the, um, after the additions ceased. So I should mention, there's quite a lot of material that hasn't been published. And so Mike Rennie and I, one of the tasks that we were thinking of taking on this summer was to kind of um, come up with an overall sort of summary, I suppose, of the entire study um, and to include a lot of the unpublished data that um, was generated. Okay, any other uh, questions? I have just a, a general one, if I can sneak another one in. Oh, sure. Um, just from a, like a, looking at the influence that research has on wider society, you've, you've been in the game quite a while. Is there anything, any response from industry or manufacturing that you can think that, okay, they've done that because of the issues we've raised, or are they just plowing ahead? They're just plowing ahead. <laughs> um, I can't think of anything that industry has done in particular to take into account uh, all the research that's that's been done on the potential for for effects. Um, no, I can't really. Um, and in terms, of, as I said, the OECD seems to have basically adopted the status quo in terms of the uh, risk assessment process. So hasn't really put too much pressure on, uh, on industry, as a matter of fact, to try to, um, you know, to, uh, to try to reduce the potential for impacts. Thank you. That's interesting. Yeah. All righty. Well, we had a few extra people join in. Um, exactly. So yeah. we are at the uh, end of our hour. And so I just want to thank you, Chris, for uh, yep. taking no the time to prepare and, and present this uh, really interesting talk. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's fit in well with some of the uh, previous talks because it sort of brings us towards the, uh, you know, what does this all mean in terms of effects? Uh, I do want to tell those of you who are still with us here that uh, next week will be the last uh, seminar in this series. Uh, the speaker will be Professor uh, Sijin Liu from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And hopefully we'll bring it full circle because he's going to talk on some human health uh, implications of mm. nanoparticles. I'll so, have to catch that one, yeah. Yes, so I hope you'll all join us. And uh, if you know some of the people who weren't able to be here today, remind them to join us next week as well. So thanks again, Chris. All, all right. right, no problem. Bye thanks. to all for now.